This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Hey everybody, it's John Holland. As we head into Labor Day, I find myself down the Jersey Shore, which is exactly where you want to be. And outside today, it's a hundred degrees with humidity to match. And I was greeted as I got out of the car with the smell of cooking wort. And it is, even on a day like this, a wonderful, wonderful aroma to be greeted with, especially when you know that it's coming from a brewery like Kane, which is where I find myself this afternoon with Mike Kane, the founder, the brewer. Do you go by anything else? No, that works. Okay, founder and brewer of Kane Brewing Company down the Jersey Shore here, which is one of the larger breweries in the state. Uh, has also been around for seven years and is not only a Jersey darling, but has also made a name for itself on the national festival circuit. Uh, if you go to Hunapu, if you were at the Weldworks Invitational earlier this year, uh, other festivals around the country, uh, you've probably seen Mike, you've probably had his beers, and certainly all of the beer message boards light up uh, every time that you come out with some new pastry stout or a new uh, something special, I, I, I guess it is, right? That's uh, yeah. You guys get a lot of the internet love. Uh, we do, yeah. It, it's 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 been a good seven years, I think. You know, and I would say thanks for coming down. We appreciate you having you here. Oh, it's great to be here. It's uh, it's always nice to be back. And uh, what's amazing to me is I, I was here when you guys first opened. Uh, you know, being a Jersey native and, and being invested in the beer scene as as, as I am, um, it's it's really been remarkable to see the growth that you guys have had, um, but also that the state has had overall. I mean, you were part of uh, this class seven years ago with Carton and a few others that opened up after some laws were were reduced and sort of led the way for this for this new wave. Yeah, it's been it's been an interesting seven years in the state. I think it's been a great seven years. It was the state itself. I think was sort of a beer wasteland for a while. We had some really, really good, but very few number of breweries um, around. I think you, you'd referenced 2011. You know, we we opened Carton opened, Cape May opened. I think Tuckahoe opened. And I think there was one other sort of bigger production brewery had opened at that time. And I think you know before that, we had New Jersey Beer Co. opened in 09, 10 time frame. But before that. Yeah. It was had really been a while since anything new had opened in New Jersey, so it's sort of an interesting sort of, you know, rebirth at that period of, of production of, of brewing back into the state of New Jersey, and since then it's just taken off like it has across the country. And what we had back then was mostly brew pubs as well. I mean, we obviously did. there's yeah. the big AB plant uh, across from Newark Airport. If anybody's ever driven the Turnpike or uh, right. flown through, like you, you've seen that, but mostly brew pubs. When you were getting ready to open, you were a home brewer first. Yes. What was your vision? What what were the beers that excited you? And did you have that translate to what Kane was in the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I love to... I started homebrewed in college. Um, so at this point, that was a while ago. Um, that was, you know, 98, 99. Um, hate to even think about it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I got my... You know, I've mentioned this before, but I got my start uh, homebrewing in college. I went to school up in Connecticut, and I spent a fair amount of time up in Vermont, in the sort of New England area, um, in the winters, you know, mostly snowboarding, skiing, going up in the winter, and, and a lot of at that point, some breweries like Long Trail and Magic Hat were still really small, and I visited them and and talked to a lot of brewers there, and they had gotten their start home brewing. I, I thought that was sort of fascinating, so I went back and, and bought myself a kit and uh, bought myself, you know, a, a complete joy of home brewing, the Papazian book that everyone seems to read, and yeah. it started with that, and that was sort of my my lead into home brewing, you know, ninety nine time frame, and. Um, as I continued to homebrew, I sort of fell in love with two styles, IPA, IPAs and, and Belgian-style beers, and I think that was what I mostly brewed as a homebrewer was... And when you're you know, saying IPAs, you're talking like American <clears throat> IPAs, yes. right? It's and not like the old British tradition. Well, it's interesting, because so. you know, the first batch of beer I ever brewed was uh, um, like a German wheat beer. It was a kid I bought, super old, you know, old yeast, dry yeast, stale, stale dry malt extract, and uh, it was awful like everybody else. And then yeah. you sort of progressed into the... You know, back then, it was a lot of the East... East Coast breweries seem to come from maybe an English or Belgian style descent. Uh, so I brewed some English style IPAs in the beginning. I remember my first all grain batch was a all Maris Otter, all EKG, like British IPA. Um, and then from that, you know, got into the Sierra Nevada thing with the, you know, Cascade, Chinook, Centennial, West Coast style IPAs and <clears throat> started brewing those. And that was mostly what I had, had gotten, had fallen in love with, um, was the, 
sort of West Coast style IPAs. That was sort of all the rage back then when I was home brewing, and then also the the Belgian style stuff. So you know, more traditional, you know, Chimay style stuff or the Allagash stuff here in the U.S. Oh my gang was great, and stuff yeah. you could get at the time. I mean, I was living in New York after college, and you know, at that time, all you could find in New York was you know maybe Boston Boston Beer, Sam Adams products mm-hmm. or Sierra Nevada. At some point, some we Brooklyn had, lagers, yeah. Bro- oh yeah, Brooklyn. I mean, Brooklyn was great. Obviously, um, we spent a lot of Friday nights there at the brewery, but. uh <laughs> you know, you start getting Magic Hat would come down, and then you get Harpoon IPA was big for a while back in the you know, early 2000s yeah. in, in New York when that came down. And um, that's sort of where I came from, from brewing. And uh, it sort of just kept progressing. And as I brewed and drank and traveled more for work, I started traveling to other breweries and sort of experienced more. I, I definitely drifted more into the brewing IPA, double IPA, really hop forward beers. Um, and that was, you know, what I mostly brewed. And when I sort of progressed into opening a brewery that was where I wanted to take it was the IPA side and, and also the Belgian style beers and you so opening up in 2011 which it seems like not too long ago but in beer in beer terms like it it, it really is a lifetime ago it, I mean it is. people were not lining up for IPAs seven years ago people were not uh, you know people like them but they were still kind of like uh, on the fringe as it were like popular among the you know the people who enjoyed uh, beer and bitterness but new england styles hadn't even come into the lexicon yet uh, no. you know some of the, the the beers that you're making now um hadn't even entered into the sort of sort of general consciousness uh, of the whole thing yeah no not at all i, mean, I think i we feel like you know seven years has gone fast for us we feel like we're just getting started but we understand how much the market's changed in the last seven years for even for us in new jersey nationally how much it's changed and it's it really is changing at an increasing rate it almost seems like every year seems to get more compacted and, and, and trends change and, and the whole scene itself seems to move more quickly than it used to. Um, we definitely feel like sometimes in New Jersey, people look at us like we're sort of the old old regime or whatever it is at this point, you know, which is, which for, is for which the is middle generation. For yeah, right, it yeah. certainly can be that way. Absolutely. But that's what I find interesting is I've been down here on Saturdays. Uh, I anybody who listens to this knows that I don't follow releases. I, everybody who knows who listens to this and also to, to steal this beer, uh, I don't stand in line for beer. I just right. I, I get the camaraderie. Right I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I just personally don't don't do it. Um, but I've been down here on Saturdays when you've had release days, and I've been greeted by the the the. the ID checker in the in the main lobby saying, "Sorry, we're already out of whatever it is that day." It's like I, I don't care. I'm just going right. to drink head just high anyway. Yeah, I'm right. just going to come and drink beer. Um, it's a, it's but it's amazing to me that you guys have been able to capture sort of the the current lightning in a bottle um, because seven years old is not old, but in beer terms, it it, it, it can be. Yeah, so well, the fact that right. people weren't lining up in the beginning because there there was no reason to line up. Uh, not because of the beer, but just right. it wasn't part of the, the general consciousness. Now that it is, people come to you and line up for beer. And, you know, there's there's posts lamenting uh, that people didn't get your beer or people reposting and, and trying to sell your beer, which is something that new breweries, somebody who opens up tomorrow can sort of achieve that. But breweries that have already been opened can have a difficult time achieving that. Yeah, and I think we've been lucky. I mean, since the beginning, the New Jersey scene wasn't super crowded when we opened. You know, I'd like to believe it was partly because of the beer, but some of the earlier stuff we did, more of the barrel age stuff, some of the stouts, the, the bigger, um, you know, the adjunct stuff we were doing a while ago, um, that's really where I think we started seeing the crowds and the lines. And I think that was early on some of the, the you know, the, I think the set, by the second release we did of uh, a barrel aged style which is Night 10 All Dawns that's where we really started to see you know the crowds lighting up beforehand and um, and that sort of built from that you know that was more from us back in the day where I think at that time people were more in tune with like the big barrel aged beers some of the adjunct stouts we were doing or other people were doing and it wasn't this the, the way the market is now where people are lining up for IPs all over the place it was just a different market at that time but I think it built off of that and I think because of the hopefully because of the 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 product quality people have continued to sort of stick with us all this time it's interesting so uh before we started recording uh, you gave me a tour because i hadn't seen the brewery uh, and some of the the new spaces that you have uh, uh in, in quite a while and we were in your barrel room as it were your barrel nook uh, right. your barrel alcove uh, uh <laughs> over here in the brewery and night to end all dawns when when that first launched was just a imperial stout aged in bourbon barrels right yes okay you said to me not too long ago, uh, as we were walking through, um, that that just doesn't get people excited anymore. 
I think what I think well, I think what I meant to say, if I, I mean I, I said it wrong, okay. that that does. I think the barrel age program in general is maybe not as exciting as it used to be. So when we do, you know, the Night and All Dawns and all of our barrel aged stouts, barrel aged adjunct stouts, all that stuff gets people are really excited about that. I think in general, barrel aged beers, we do, um, we've sort of tried to grow that program. So we do barrel aged barley wines and barrel aged um, <clears throat> old ales or stock ales. We've done, you know, barrel aged like saisons. We do a, a tequila aged saison. I think some of that other barrel aged stuff isn't quite as interesting two people but yeah the the barrel aged stouts and porters and adjunct stouts and porters those still people are still really excited about that but i don't think it's barrel aging in general the way it used to be because yeah. everybody if you launch now a brewery if somebody opens up tomorrow they're probably going to have a barrel program they're you know, yeah at least you walk one or two in, you walk I mean, I in think, day yeah. one and there's right. going to be at least a couple of barrels yeah. i mean we the did corner. the same thing our the fourth batch of beer we brewed was a barrel aged stout or it's a stout that we were going to age in barrels and specifically yeah, for, for that for barrel aging, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. and so I think that's I think a lot of people will at least try to get their hands on two or three, four or five, whatever they can fit in, depending on the size of their their location. Um, but I don't know if it's as um, <clears throat> as much of a focus for the market as it used to be. What I found interesting was you said early on you had uh, all of your barrels in temperature controlled rooms, uh, and now they're sort of in. The open air, as it were. So humi- uh, humidity in the summer. Uh, if the bay doors are open in the winter, they're they're getting blasted. Um, what have you found works for your beers, temperature control wise? Because you hear, you know, so much about you know, short of hermetically sealing off a room right. uh, like a humidor. Um, there's so many different thoughts. What what have you guys found in the the seven years that you've been doing this? Well, we did early early on the first few batches of barrel aged beers. We had obviously excess room in our coal box, and so we wanted to keep things more temperature controlled. And we stored our barrel, which again at that point was, you know, ten twelve barrels at most. So it wasn't a huge program at that point. We kept those temperature controlled in our coal box because uh, we thought that would probably work out a little bit better. What we found was at that point. We just ran out of room in the coal box to be honest with you. So we had to pull some out of the coal box and store them in the ambient room. And um, we found over time those changes in temperature sort of help uh, develop some of those flavors we were looking for. The, the change in temperature, from the, you know, our, our warehouse is not temperature controlled. Right. So in the winter, it's, you know, 50, 60 degrees. In the summer, it's 100 degrees. Those swings in temperatures help pull some of the flavors in it, you know, pull the beer in and out of the wood, extract some of the flavors. Um, the humidity that we get here in New Jersey in the summer, which is insane. Brutal really helps i think maybe reduce some of the lost the barrels don't dry out as much you don't get as much evaporation um so i think the ambient storage here has helped what we do um and like and said, when you're saying flavor you're talking like some of the wood tan and some of the yeah some of the some of the you know we we tend to age our beers a little bit longer i think than most people do in oak so we'll we'll put beer in into oak and let it sit maybe for six months before we even taste it uh obviously we taste before it goes in and we do lab and we make sure it's all clear and then we put it in um, we'll give it about six months, then we'll taste it. Usually nine to 12 months is where, in our mind, we think that beer might be ready, somewhere between 12 to 16 months. And we think that longer aging, as long as you brew the beer to stand up to that much time in the, in the, in the wood and it doesn't get over, over tannin or over oak, it helps develop some of those more subtle like vanilla and caramel and coconut flavors you can get from, especially bourbon barrels in the oak, um, you get from those that you may not draw out of the wood if you only age it for, say, three months or four months. Sure. So that's what we like. But at the same time, if you give it 12 or 16 months and that beer isn't isn't really brewed to stand up to that, it's going to obviously be very oaky and very tannic and, and not, you know, you're going to, Pull out the some of the flavors you're looking for, but overall the beer's not going to be very good. So, so you're going in with a pretty robust stout yeah. recipe right off the bat. We do, and we found in the that was another thing we found at the beginning where we would take beers that we just brewed and throw them in oak and see like, hey, let's let's see what happens. Yeah, why you not? know, yeah. why not? And we're learning everything in the beginning. And some of those times we got lucky, we got really good beers, and other times what we found out was that if you if you at least again for us that if you brew a beer to drink out of the fermenter, it may not drink as well out of a barrel a year later. And the same thing, you know, vice versa. If you brew a beer fresh that's supposed to be barrel aged, it may not be the type of beer you want to drink day one out of the fermenter. And so we specifically design recipes and develop beers for oak versus not oak. So if we want to do an imperial stout that we're just going to release as an imperial stout, that recipe will look different than a, a stout that we plan on barrel aging for 16 months. Can and you so, give an example of, of how it's different? <clears throat> a lot of times it just has to do with body and sweetness and like the malt you use to develop that. Um, <clears throat> we'll try to make it uh, a lot 
a lot bigger starting gravity, a lot, finish a lot higher, maybe add some more low level caramel malt or um, just to sort of build up the body and not have it drink so dry because we've pulled, we pulled beers out of oak that, you know, finish around 10 Plato, which is really sweet. Yeah. And you drink it and it, and people are like, man, it's a really dry beer. And it's just the perception <laughs> of dryness because all of the oak and the tannins and the other flavors in there yeah. really dry it out. And then you carbonate it on top of that and that adds another little sort of layer of, um, of, of dryness and, and drinkability, which is good. But, you know, if that beer had come out at, you know, four Play-Doh or six Play-Doh or, you know, where, where, where IPA finishes at, you know, two and a half, three Play-Doh, it would be almost undrinkable because it would be yeah. so dry and, and tannic. And so that's the sort of things we look for. Um, and sometimes depending on what, if we, if we plan on adjuncting a beer, you know, we do that with our coffee, coffee beers where we'll pull back the roasted character of the base beer because we know later we're going to add coffee and, if we feel like there's certain components we're going to get from the oak, we may pull that out, some carbon malts that we might get from bourbon or oak. We'll take that out of the base recipe so that it's not over overpowering at the end. And so we're just trying to take into account whatever barrel or adjunct or whatever we're going to do post-fermentation into the recipe. What I find interesting is they're, they're, because so many breweries have a quote-unquote barrel program these days and because they're eager to get people interested in their beer it, so much of it is a turn and burn it is right. hey we're going to make this and we're going to put it out three months later when you're talking uh, a year 16 months uh longer that there, there's a discipline that comes with that i mean obviously you know what the reward will be or you hope you know what the reward will be but there, but there's a real discipline that comes with that that i don't know if we see in this sort of immediate world these days where you know there's certain beers that are being made where if you don't drink them within two weeks they're going to blow up in your backyard <laughs> right. um I, I, am i missing that is that is that well does i think this you know, play a role in this or is it i, there, I think there's it is interesting you know i, I think there, i thought you wrote on a different road too there i mean there are from a barrel perspective there are quick barrel beers that i've had that taste great too and i think that's just perspective brewer's perspective and what they want to do and what they're trying to accomplish with that beer that you can put a beer in oak for three months four months and it depends on style i mean we've done you know we've got a um a saison that we've done we did years ago and we finally got some reliable reliable source of good tequila barrels recently that we did uh we, we brewed it again to it's called Curtillo and it was a, a saison in in um tequila barrels mm -hmm. these tequila barrels are wine barrels their previous ones were first bourbon then tequila and they were uh in what i was say rougher shape by the time we got them and these because wine barrels are a little more well built and a little more robust it held up better and um, but that type of beer, you know, we're going to do that four to six months at most because we don't, you know, the Saison can't really stand up to that. So there are some quick barrel beers that, you know, hold up, that are reasonable. It's just, you know, like I said, mostly it's up to the brewer's perspective is what they're trying to do. Um, I think what you're talking about more is the, you know, the need for freshness. And I think, like I said, when we were opening some of the bigger beers, you know, you go to bottle shares then and it was all 750s of barrel aged beers and high alcohol <laughs> beers. And it was a very different market or, or scene than it is now where it's a lot of, you know, all super fresh IPAs, double IPAs, um, fruited IPAs, fruited kettle sours, and those are the type of things that, yeah, you need to drink fast. And the only thing I would say, well, not the only, but one of the real benefits to that is people are at least drinking their beer now. There was a time where it was, people are buying beers and sitting on them and none of the stuff is getting drank in. And we'd have people come back and be like, oh, hey, I've got this bottle. It's three years old. Should I drink it? And we're like, yes, drink it. Like, yeah. you know, it's three years you should, old. You should have had yeah, it three right. years yes. ago. So, yeah. um, and I get, you know, there was, I think, you know, and you try to go way back into thinking, but there was, you know, the early craft, you know, craft beer revolution. Some of the early brewers, I think when they were doing some of the higher alcohol beers, before the learning was there, some of these beers maybe didn't need to sit on. But I felt like there was a point at which time where brewers in this country had learned how to make really good high alcohol beers that didn't need to be aged that well. And would age and develop flavors, and you could sit on it for a while, but there was an extreme where people were taking it too far, where it was like three years later, and it's like, well, let's, you know, drink the beer. Yeah. So at least now with some of the, you know, some of the more in-demand beers that are, are, are IPAs, at least people are, are sharing them and drinking them fresh, which is good. The downside of that is people who don't understand that maybe sitting on some of these beers a little too long, and then, you know, it's, you know you've got a six-month-old IPA, and it's like, well, that, you know, that probably should have been drank by now. And that's sort of the interesting thing. So... This is still very much an IPA house, right? Yes. I mean, it's well, and that's yeah, and that's what I was going to say yeah. before was the barrel aging 
program is a very small percent of, from volume perspective, very small percent of what we do. It's something we love to do. And where like I said, regardless of where the market moves, we're going to continue to do them because it's something we love to do and love to drink. But yeah, it's a very small percent of what we do. Yeah. But unless you were selling head high in the amounts that you are right now, uh, you wouldn't have the Right, the it ability helps. to do yeah, these absolutely. things. Absolutely, yeah. yes. That, and that's why we can sit on a beer for a year and a half and not worry about it too much because that's not a core business. Yeah. Where do you see everything with IPA right now? Like, where do you see the IPA realm, as it were? I mean, everybody talks about haze, um, but y- you started with some of these classic styles. You now do hazy styles. Uh, you know, you do West Coast style. You, you sort of make everything, uh, right. a- as it were. You're not just known for um, one kind. And so you sort of have this interesting perspective. And you also get to travel around to, to festivals. I've, I've seen you uh, across the country at a lot of these things. And you're tasting a lot of the new flavors. You're seeing a lot of what, what comes out. Like, What's your take on where IPA is right now? Um, you know, for me, it breaks comes down to, you know, goes back to quality, which is, you know, I love all IPAs, but they have to be well-made. So I think it's, you know, I love a really well-made West Coast IPA, or I love a really well-made hazy or New England style IPA, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm more than happy to drink a old Sierra Nevada Pale Ale anytime. I've got some well-made beer. I'm I'm more than happy to drink that. And I think for me, it comes down to quality is more the, should be more the focus than the style or is it West Coast? Is it East Coast? Is it hazy? Is it clear? Is it, what does it taste like? Do you enjoy drinking it? And not everyone enjoys drinking the same style of beer all the time. So I think it's, you know, it's nice to have a variety of people brewing different things. I mean, there's brews out there who are only, or are more well-known for drinking or making clearer, more West Coast style IPAs. And those beers are fantastic, you know, and I know there's a lot of uh, hazy, you know, New England style IPAs that are awesome to drink too. And so I think it's, it's nice if we have 6,000 breweries in this country that people are doing different things. I don't think we need 6,000 breweries making the same beer um, so <clears throat> it's nice to have a breadth of styles within that IPA category. And, and uh, you know, ABV ranges too. You know, you want, always want to drink a 8% double IPA. You may want to sometimes drink a 4%, you know, session IPA that you can, you know, have a couple of. And I think that variety is nice. Um, where it's, you know, who knows where it's going to go. I mean, I think the Hayes thing is, is probably going to stick around for a while. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't been, think it's a fad. No, yeah. absolutely not. And I think there have been some other, since we've opened, you've seen some other sort of IPA styles, like a black IPA and session IPA. And some of these things sort of came and, came and went relatively quickly. I know the session IPA is still here, but it's not as sort of prevalent. Not as prevalent, as well yeah. As, yeah. And, and so, certainly black IPA, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be the next thing. Right. And then it, it sort of didn't go Belly anywhere. flopped, yeah. Right. So I, I don't necessarily think the, because I, I it's, you know, it's, it's a good style. I mean, it's, it, if it's well made, people like to drink it. It's uh, got a lot of flavor, and so I don't. But see if you why. put one on, if you put a black IPA on, would people just look at you funny? Probably. I mean, I don't think they. Would, at this point, we do brew a lot of different beers. I don't think people would be surprised. But it's interesting because we we tend to stick to styles that we like to drink. And I've never been a big black IPA fan, so we've never made one. But you know, I think people wouldn't be all that surprised as you like, oh, it's just another beer they're making. I mean, for us internally, I think we, I think the the perception. Externally, is probably different from the perception internally because we make so much of our core beers that when we do a batch of black IPA, it's sort of a drop in the bucket of like what we're brewing that year. And if one of our brewers comes up and says, hey, I really love black IPAs, can we make one? You know, a 20 or 40 barrel batch of black IPA that we put in the tasting room and sell to some local draft accounts isn't really that big a deal in the grand scheme of all the beer we're making. But I think externally, people would see that and be like, well, why are you guys wasting your time on that? You know, but... It's, you know, it's the internal versus external perception is a little different. Well, and that's sort of the interesting thing, right? Because you hear, you said it before uh, of, you know, uh, you like to drink what, uh, you make like, you you like to make what you like to drink, uh, as it were. And I hear that from (coughs) a lot of different brewers. You know, that was Founders' old tagline. You know, like, uh, we drink what we want and then we sell the rest. And, you know, there's their famous story of that they were trying to be everything to everybody and then just before they had to shut off the lights, they're like, screw it, like, let's just screw around. And they found an audience in that and now they're, you know, huge. And now right. they're turning out Session IPA all day. Right. And, you know, I think they did something like 400,000 barrels of that beer last year. Yeah, 200,000 barrels of that beer last year. Um, but you guys just came out with a Pilsner. Uh, yeah, we've done a couple lagers. You've, d- yep, you've done yep. them over, over the years. But the, yep. this one that's out coming into um, uh, the, one of the last weekends of unofficial summer right. uh, as it were and it's sort of this throwback uh, pills you're saying uh, and I want to talk about that in a second but this is the type of beer that you guys want to drink around the brewery but will people line up for this will people no 
Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, frankly, it's it is it's one of those projects. We have projects around here that we love to do as brewers, and I think when we opened, and I'm sorry, you you do you call know. it a lager on here. For some reason, I keep calling no, it fine. a pills. We, but yeah, we've made pills. I mean, that's okay. fine. It's the um, you know, there's certain beers around here we make coming when we opened. The plan was to be a little bit more focused, probably. But because I come from a homebrew background and homebrewers love to try everything, we easily get distracted. And it's it's one of those things where we're, we're probably not good at is planning and beer calendars. And you just, you know, <laughs> this day is when this release is going to come out. And this day is when this release is going to come out. We're going to you know let everyone know about it. And we're going to planning and, and you know, roll it out. And it, it's more, I think, comes from that, that homebrew background of just like, hey, this sounds cool. Let's do that. And, um, you know... We get influenced by the brewers we have here. We've had some brewers who really like lagers. I, you know, I've been drinking. I think the last six pack I bought was a. Um, I think the Hockershire Oktoberfest just came out, and I picked yeah. up a six pack of that. Um, you know, it's 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 an easy drinking beer. I mean, I drink IPAs and double IPAs all the time, but it's nice every now and then to switch to a, to a lager. And so we had some some brewers who really wanted to brew lagers, and, and we thought it was an interesting challenge because we'd never done it before. And so we started about maybe a year, year and a half ago. Started just you know playing around with twenty barrel batches, and we have some ten barrel tanks. We do. 10 barrel one off of these things and and that was one of them we wanted to brew a um you know we envisioned a new jersey lager would look like from you know maybe you know pre-prohibition prohibition era it's you know vienna a lot of vienna malt um a little bit of corn i was gonna say you know, yeah you had traditional to go back to some uh, of those, yeah. yeah we used uh i think we used like a mexican lager strain in that which is what we've sort of we played around with a bunch of different lager strains and we think that's the one we sort of seem to like right now um what did you like about it 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 ferments it's it's flexible, you know. I mean, you can't. You, some lager strains are a little more temperamental. I mean, it seems to work pretty well for across different styles, and um, it, it finishes out. We, you know, we want to make sure our lagers are pretty dry, mm-hmm. um, and so <clears throat> we've tried some South, you know, like some German styles. Uh, we used the Augustiner strain for a while, and that actually worked pretty well. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble with that harvesting and just getting being able to repitch because it just it. it it wouldn't flock too well, and it would stick to the side of the cone. It was just tough, tough to get out. So, um, this Mexican lager strain seems to be working a little bit better for repitching um, and collecting. So, but yeah, it's a, it's more of a it's you know traditional German hollow tower. It's got a little bit of a mandarina in it. So we've tried to play with some of the old German hops and the new German hops, and um, it's just drinkable. It's five percent. It's sort of a, a sort of Vienna lager style beer with a little you know a little bit of you know corn in it and. Um, you know, it's not that exciting. It's not that interesting, but it's a really clean, good, crisp beer to drink in the summer. And looking to <clears throat> history, though, and, and thinking back to pre because, I mean, you could just say, like, hey, this is just a longer that we want, you know, today, um, or, you know, that is being made in countless places uh, uh, today. What was the appeal for you guys to sort of look back into history? We wanted to do something that was a little bit different. I mean, you know, it's instead of just brewing... Like I said, the, I think the point of lagers mostly are that, you know, they're very traditional beers and there's not much to them. And that's what makes them very drinkable and, and interesting, an interesting counterpoint to some of the other beers being made today. And so we wanted to look back in New Jersey and New Jersey's got a, a pretty deep brewing history. If you sort of go back, um, you know, <clears throat> to the 1800s and I think at one point there was like 80, 90 breweries in the state. And yeah. so most of them brewing lager, most of them, you know, obviously German descent German people coming over here and, and opening breweries up in you know the Newark area and I think Pat's in Jersey City. Patterson, yeah. yeah and so we we thought it'd be interesting just being as a New Jersey brewery and we f- we focus on our home state a lot I mean we only distribute beer in New Jersey and uh, we thought it'd be fun to brew something that was sort of had a you know a throwback feel to New Jersey in it and um, it seemed like an interesting style that had a little bit more flavor than just like a crisp clean Hellas. Um, had a little bit of you know more malty backbone and I thought people might like it it's something we could drink so. I want to get back to, to what I was saying before, though, of you're making what you want to drink, but you can't actually really convince people. Uh, you know, people won't line up for it, uh, for, 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 right. for a lager like this. I find that so interesting because shouldn't we, the drinkers, trust the brewer's palate? So like, it, it seems like, you know, everybody goes nuts every time there's a new... You know, glitter beer. There's this brewery down in, in Philadelphia that, uh, or outside of Pens- uh, outside of Philadelphia, that just did a uh, an all sugar water. Those little hugs. Uh, remember like, when we were growing up? They had these uh, these little oh, right. barrels yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Of, yep. of brightly colored sugar water liquid. Yep. They used all of that as their uh, as their brewing liquid oh, okay. um, uh, instead of water. Yeah, but like people line up and they they go nuts. Like, oh my god, we got to do that and because the internet tells them that they that they should be doing this. 
shouldn't we be listening to to brewers of like, hey, we like drinking this lager, why not give it a try? I, I yeah, well, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the people making that beer, I'm assuming, like to like to make that, and so I guess their their customers are listening to that brewer and sure. say you should be drinking this. But um, I, you know, I think there's we do a lot of different style beers. I think there's just different beers for different times, and you know, we you know, a lager is a a nice. I'm sitting at the beach, hanging out with my friends, drinking beer beer and then there's other times where i want to drink a 10 percent, you know coconut you know barrel aged porter or whatever yeah. and um i think that's why we brew different beers for different times and you know we don't always want to drink a lager we don't always want to drink barrel aged beers and um you know we don't always want to drink an ipa and that's why we do different styles i think i ultimately leave it up to like i said we we leave it to the customers to sort of decide what they want to drink you know we sell a lot of beer the one thing we do is we sell we do sell a lot of beer to what I would consider more of a mainstream beer drinking crowd, not mm-hmm. just you know beer geeks or whatever you want to term you want to use. And so, <clears throat> when we do the lagers, we sell a lot of it to a different crowd. So we're not getting the people who line up for our barrel aged beers and line up for the IPAs or line up for the adjunct beers, but we're selling a lot of it draft to you know a certain crowd that goes out and drinks beer, you know three three or four beers with dinner on a Friday Saturday night. So. <clears throat> when we say we don't sell it, we sell it. It's just to a different crowd, I think, and it's a different market, and it's and it's not getting the attention, right? And that's fine. I mean, we don't necessarily, you know, not every beer we make needs to be, you know, a line of beer. You know, it's it, at the size we're at now. I think we're we're selling. We do look at it internally as we have different beers that we sort of sell to different people. You know, and that's that's fine. You've been at a lot of the. I find it interesting that you guys are Jersey only, yes. uh, but you've been at a lot of the big national festivals. Uh, you're at Hunapu, uh, run by Cigar City every year. I saw you out in the, the wilds of Greeley, Colorado at the <laughs> yes. Weldworks Invitational yeah, earlier. Yeah. It was. It was a, it's, a, it's a cool little town uh, east of Fort Collins, as it were, north of Denver. Um, why go to these things? Like, what, what do you yeah, get out of it? Is we, it? we get those, that question. I, I love, you know, we do it because I love, what I like about brewing and why I got into it is I like making the beer and I also like drinking beer with other people who make beer. So it's fun to go out to these festivals. And when we get when we go there, we get a chance to travel, see other breweries, meet other brewers, talk to them about what they're doing, you know, taste some of these <laughs> different beers that maybe we're not brewing, different styles, sugar, water beer, whatever you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> um, we do it because it you know, selfishly gives us the opportunity to travel and, and try new beers and meet brewers and see old friends and sort of hang out. and. And also meet people who we don't normally get to sell beer to. So the people at those events are the ones who are really knowledgeable about beer, really knowledgeable about what we're doing, really knowledgeable about the whole scene. And it's fun to talk to those guys. And so, you know, we may not have any interest in, you know, shipping head high to Denver right now. It's still fun to go out there and talk to the people who drink beer. The really, you know, dedicated beer drinkers, home brewers that go to these festivals. And like I said, to talk to other brewers and see what they're doing and uh, meet other people. And it's, you know, it's just a lot of fun, you know. In addition to drawing inspiration from hanging out and visiting those breweries and, and talking with those brewers. Where else are you drawing inspiration from on when you're thinking about what to make next? Uh, you know, we, as we've grown as a company, we sort of look a little more internally. I, we've, the first you know, six years or so, I've spent a lot of time working basically on recipe development and quality. I mean, that's what I sort of view my job at this point as, is quality control and, and you know, recipe development and sort of tweaking some things. And what we're trying to do now is that we've got we've got maybe ten or twelve people on our brew staff, and so drawing inspiration from them, let them have more input into what it is we're doing. Um, they all have interesting ideas, and at some point, you know, you want to get more people involved in in sort of the, the concepts of what we're doing. Um, we've always looked toward I mean, the obvious stuff you look towards. You look toward food. I mean, food is a natural, especially a lot of these adjunct beers. It, you know, basically, a lot of it comes from different, you know, junk food. Yeah. yeah well. These days, I guess, to jump Sugary through. Sugary desserts. But yeah, you know. Um, but uh, a lot of that, too, is just, you know, interesting idea. You know, I sort of, sort of wander sometimes through, you know, um, grocery stores and, and, you know, farmer's markets and stuff, find interesting ideas. A lot of our um, IPAs early on that were one also driven by different ingredients. So we had another malt we wanted to try. You know, there's a, there's a newer malt or there's a newer hop or some, some new hop, you know, a hop extract or some hop powder or something we hadn't tried before. Like I said, it goes back to us being homebrewers at heart and wanted to try everything and, and, you know, never being settled on anything. And so <clears throat> I think a lot of that inspiration comes from ingredients or from, you know, looking at, looking at what other people are doing. Uh, we're in harvest right now, hop harvest season. Uh, there's been uh, obviously the, the 
craft brewers conference happens every year, and all of the uh, uh, the hop growers and providers come, and they uh, they show off what's new, be it you know the powders or the cryo or uh, anything along those lines. H- have you heard of anything? Is there anything that's exciting you right now with hops that's either no. coming online or? No, I mean, there's still some some varieties we haven't tried that we're trying to get our hands on that we think would be interesting. We're heading out to harvest, I guess probably like three weeks from now maybe, to do hop selection. So I think we'll probably learn a little bit more then. Okay. We've played around with different powders, different, you know, they've changed the powders a little bit from powder to pellet, pe- pellet powder. And, um, some of those things have been really interesting with, you know, flavor contribution and, you know, loss, which is, you know, more of a issue with us than, you know, consumer. But, um... But nothing right now that um, that I know of that we're interested to go out to harvest and see what's going on this year. You're talking about having, what, a dozen people on your brewing staff now? Yeah, I think we've got between, yeah, it's probably about 12. Between, we've got a, one lab person, we include her, that, and you know our director of brewing operations. So it's probably about 12 guys, I think. Uh, you mentioned uh, before we started recording that one of your guys just came from the Rare Barrel or has uh, uh, history there. Yeah, it was a while. He probably came over at it. Probably about a year, year and a half ago now, but <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but having that experience, um, you guys are putting a cool ship in. We are. We started doing a, what you know what we're calling our mixed fermentation program probably last spring, early spring. Um, we have something we wanted to do. He came over. Um, he's from New Jersey. He sort of came over as a hire. He wanted to come back to the state, and um, and you know, as he was here working, and we started talking more, it was something that we thought he could sort of fly, you know lead a little bit you know and take control of that so we started last spring um with a like i said with the mixed fermentation program we've basically what we do is we brew the wort we got a separate warehouse that we were using at that point for dry storage and we sort of moved that into a new warehouse and um <clears throat> use that facility for the fermentation and aging and so we still brew the wort here on on the sort of original brewery side in the 20 barrel system we bring that wort over there we ferment it in the punchings we have over there and then once it's done fermentation move it into wine barrels for secondary aging and you know it's still early on so we started doing some fruit blends over there and some experimentations with some of the base beer but we haven't released anything and we're sort of still a little bit away from having anything ready to go but uh it's going well it's been fun again some of those things that isn't necessarily the the driver of what we're doing here isn't necessarily core but just you know sort of sits alongside the barrel aging program of something that we're really interested in doing and we wanted to do and sort of have the opportunity now to do it because of all the, the sort of the, the growth in the core stuff. We're also getting into harvest season for a lot of fruits that are that are out there uh, these right. days. Jersey being the garden state, we're, there's no shortage of actual great no. produce that, that's coming our way uh, for everybody who's out of state who's snickering right now. Right. Uh, go to hell. Um, but it, you've been fooling around with a couple of different fruits um, at, at this point. Like what, what, do, what do you look for? Um, when doing some of these mixed fermentation, uh, you know, some of these beers, uh, but giving them fruit additions. Like what, what appeals to you with those right. ingredients? Well, I think we've done, you know, when you talk about for inspiration, we've done, a lot of lo- we've done a lot of local ingredient pairing, be it with you know, local coffee. We do an apple cider beer with a local cider beer. We've been doing it forever. Um, we've done peach beers on the clean, you know, sort of quote, unquote, see clean side. Uh, with New Jersey grown peaches years ago. And so we do try to look, the beauty of New Jersey, like I said, people will laugh at is that there are great locally grown ingredients that you can incorporate. We do a lot of fruited IPAs and that all that stuff we do, puree, antiseptic, because we don't, obviously don't want to have issues with. Um, <clears throat> and like know. getting from out of state, the puree. Right, like yeah. That, yeah. And so, but on this, this mixed fermentation side, yeah, we've done all um, locally grown fruit. So we've got it, we got it about 1,300 pounds of peaches a few, uh, probably a few weeks ago at this point. Um, from a farm in South Jersey, we got we picked cherries at a local farm here in Freehold, which is just maybe 15 minutes away. Early you guys in the summer, pick them? we did pick those. We went out there and got um, I can't remember what the brewery the field trip. It was yeah, it was two or three guys went out there and uh, early on, I think the first day that they had it was um, it was like pick your own places and yeah. um, picked you know I don't know, forget how many quantities it was, but you know hundreds of pounds of cherries and came back here and processed them and um, so we've got that going. We uh, <clears throat> dip, took the pits out, processed them, cut them in half, threw them, and we actually aged that in a barrel. So we pureed the cherries, put them back in the barrel, and racked the beer on top of them. And so they're sitting there now, aging. Uh, we've got blackberries going, um, elderberries. I think what else we did? We've got. We're getting ready for. Uh, we've got a lot of our punchins 
that we ferment in from Alba up in North Jersey, the winery. And so we're planning to get some um, grape juice from them from their fall harvest this fall. Uh, so that'll probably start in a couple of weeks, maybe next month or so. So we've been do what we've been doing is taking some of the base beer we brewed early on last spring and sort of dividing it up in one or two barrels of each of these different fruits. And so our first year, we want to you know sort of experiment with how they how they ferment out, what kind of flavor contribution there is. You know, we did one, I think we have one barrel of blueberries as well. So we've got maybe, you know, eight to 10 oak barrels of different varieties of fruit on this base beer that we made. And so we'll sort of see how those come out and decide what we're gonna do with them um, later in the year. I don't know if you were just teasing when you were saying that you don't actually, uh, earlier, that, that you don't plan out a schedule, that you're not as uh, coordinated as you should be with these things. Because when, when you're brewing, <coughs> <coughs> uh, with fruit, and you have to go out and, and, and pick. Like there, there is some planning that comes. There into is, that. and I think, yeah, it's more on the on the release side where we're okay. not necessarily great with um, getting these things out. But yeah, there is there is a certain extent with the fruit beer. It really was uh, in the beginning of the summer. We sat down and said, okay, what are we going to look for this summer? What, what fruits are we going to go after? And what is the peak season for them? And and so we did have to plan that out a little bit. But it is very, it's sort of shotgun. Like, you know, we'll call the farm. They're like, hey, peaches this week. Got to get them. And we'll run down there and get them, run back, try and process them and get them in and sort of squeeze them into all the other stuff we got going on. So it, it could be a drop everything and let's... It is. The, our drivers are out driving around New Jersey. We'll try to reroute them to pick up the fruit, bring it back here. We'll try and move some things around and try and, you know, we get, we, we've got some, we've got a lot of help from, you know, like our county or, you know, back office, quote unquote people. Yeah. They'll jump in and help, you know, cut up peaches or, you know, the pit cherries or whatever needs to happen, puree blackberries or whatever it is we're doing and they can sort of put down what they're doing for the day and sort of help out with that. So does, does that still speak to some of the, you've mentioned being a home brewer several times. Does that still speak to the nature of that? Because at some point you know, you get so big where that just becomes impractical and you get the, you know, you get everything either processed or pureed or you move away from the, the super fresh and you, you lose some of that camaraderie. Yeah. I, I, I've talked to brewers who have lamented that in the past. I do. I think some of these projects we work on is nice because it, sort of, it, it is small and we want to bring it back to sort of the root of, of home brewing and being more hands-on and not as, like I said, when we, we, we have to plan, but we plan our weeks around our core beers. So do we have you know, enough head high draft we need, enough head high cans we need, overhead sneak box, those are the three beers we have all the time. And you know, around that schedule, we plug in one-offs and figure out days we can brew a beer to get into barrels. And so that's how we draw that's how sort of our schedule is driven it's like what is the demand and what is our capacity for some of these core beers and then we have to sort of work everything else around that um but it is nice to go back and be like okay you know we've brewed 250 barrels of head high this week yeah on autopilot basically let's do something interesting let's go back to sort of what we were doing and that's i think the mixed fermentation project and some of this barrel age stuff we do is sort of sort of goes back to that you know you mentioned earlier uh, an apple cider beer, which y you don't yeah. see too many of those uh, no. that are out there these days. What are, is it a blend? How are you? It's what we do. We it, we did it the first year we opened. It was um, it's called Malice. It's the concept in that was sort of take one of those like warm, you know, apple cider hot toddy things, whatever they are, and, and sort of convert that into a beer. So we took a, a I love Belgian style beers. So we took our Belgian dark strong recipe. And instead of the candy sugar that we have in it, we take the apple cider we get from a, a local orchard here. We bring the cider and boil that down and sort of reduce it into almost like its own apple cider, cider syrup. Okay. And use that in uh, as the syrup addition. And then we would add some, <clears throat> you know, like c cinnamon, orange peel, some of the other spices you would see, allspice, nutmeg. Yeah. Some of the things you, you would see in those types of drinks. It was sort of our answer, you know, when we opened, there were a lot of emphasis on pumpkin beers. Like that was huge back then. And I'm not a huge pumpkin beer guy. We wanted to do something for the fall. We wanted to incorporate sort of a local ingredient, something that had a little bit of a twist on it. So that was the thing that we sort of came up with that um, <clears throat> worked well. We did it in 750s, we carbonated it, we bottle conditioned it uh, early years and sort of carbonated a little bit higher and sort of more of a traditional Belgian thing to it. And yeah. so we do that in the fall. I think it's it's an interesting concept. It is a great beer, but I, as a whole, Belgian style beers aren't all that, you know, interesting. I think to the mass. But it's again, it's one of those things we love to do. And it's, at least, it's working with a local, um, local farm here, which is great. You know. As we start to wrap up, a question I've been asking uh, folks is, what's your hope for beer? Yeah, you know, I hope the you know the market is obviously we talked about at the beginning has grown a lot in New Jersey and throughout the country. I think we were. You know, there were probably twelve to fifteen hundred breweries in the country when we opened. Six thousand, seven thousand breweries now. Yeah, I, I hope the market can sort of sustain all this. I mean, obviously, you don't want 
you don't want the industry to sort of turn and, and go through some of the bubble it went through in like the in mid mid to late nineties. Um, I hope everyone is sort of, sort of able to survive and find their niche and, and do what they need to do. And I mean, I think that's what it is. I think, it, you know, again, I let, we talk about it here all the time. I think it comes down to quality. I mean, I think quality beer, people always ask us, you know, where's the beer, where's the market going? And I think you make quality beer, I think you're, you'll be fine. You, you may not be able to grow into a Lagunitas. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen again. Where yeah, that's going to be Start difficult. small and turn into an international, you know, you know, conglomerate. But, you know, if you're, we have a lot of brewer, brewers here that have left to open their own brewery. I mean, that's sort of the source of our turnover here is people leaving to, to open their own brewery, which is great for them. And I tell them, you know, if you're happy just opening a brewery and running a small family business and making beer you love and being part of an interesting industry, you're, that that's great. If you have more sort of higher ambitions, you know, maybe that's not going to happen. And so it, my hope is that everyone sort of can get out of the market what they want out of it and that it doesn't sort of collapse on itself. But, uh, you know, that's sort of where we're at. I think it'll be an interesting five. It's been a really interesting, you know, five to seven years that we've been opening, opened. I'm really curious to see what happens over the next five years. And quality, I think, is paramount. It, it is one of these things that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, you know, because it, we are in an age where uh, there are people putting out IPAs where cans explode or, right. you know, things spoil or, you know, infections get in and, and, and God knows what else is happening. Um, what do you see your responsibility as a brewery owner uh, and a brewer to talk to consumers about quality? Like, you know, where, I, like where does that I, yeah. conversation start? I think it starts here. I mean, I think we we need to be a sort of the gatekeepers of quality internally. I mean, I think we, in, at Kane here, we try to hold ourselves to a really high standard of quality. And if we're not happy with something, we don't want to release it. Um, if it's from, you know, beer quality, packaging quality, you know, release quality. I mean, we've even, you know, customer service quality. I mean, we try to keep everything, <clears> and, you know, I'm sure people listening will laugh at that to a certain extent. I mean, we've had some challenges with our location and, beer releases and parking in the town and our neighbors. And so there's, there's, there's external challenges we yeah, deal course. with, but I think that's where it starts. You know, I think each, each brewery owner sort of has to decide what's quality for that. You know, for me, I, I, I don't necessarily think I want to release a, a can of beer that might explode, but obviously other people have different opinions on that. And so, you know, it's, that's where I just need to have to, again, it's, it's the perspective of the, of the, of the brewery owner and the people working in the brewery to decide what they believe quality to be. And, what how important is it you know is it is it important enough to say well maybe this batch of beer didn't turn out great but we really can't financially afford to dump it so we'll just try and get it out you know that's where you have to decide well no we've got to decide this this isn't good and so long term you have a, you know our 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 quality measures more of a long-term perspective you know i think something we do something that you can get away with now i think will build on itself over time and you'll sort of lose that you know perceptual quality and i think that to me it's important so that's where I think it's a lot of internal decisions. We, you know, we just last week when I was talking to you, we had a chiller go down. We had an accident in the industrial park we were in. Our chiller was down for a day. <coughs> Batch of beer we brewed the day before got up to eighty-eight degrees. It wasn't a saison, <coughs> you know. So we dumped it. I mean, just you know, you deal with it and you move on. You fix the chiller, the electrical went out. It's an accident that happens, and and you move on. And so I think that's where. You know, you could probably, we probably could have kept that batch of beer and blended it slowly into other batches and, and nobody would have noticed. But I think at the end of the day, it's just, you know, you dump the beer, it's bad, you move on. And, and I think that's, if you don't do those types of things internally, I think even people see that and say, well, okay, well, I guess quality isn't that important. So I can, I can, I can shortcut on this tank I'm cleaning. I can shortcut on these, on these DO measurements in the canning line. I can, you know, no one here really cares about quality. So it's not that important. Yeah. So I think follow the leader. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's sort of how you have to look at quality is just like, what does every brewery determine is important? from a quality perspective. Mike Kane, founder and brewer at Kane Brewing down here on the Jersey Shore where everything is all right, as uh, Springsteen once said. Uh, if people want to find you, you're on all of the various uh, social medias. and. Uh, yeah, as a company, we are. Okay. Uh, Mike Kane yeah, is don't not. Do but, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and I, you know, I, the way I look at it is I'm at the brewery Thursday night, Friday night, Saturdays where we're open, and I love people come, I love people coming to talk to them. And, you know, people have... You know, it's not convenient for people to come down here, but you know that's where I like to talk to people, and I'm not really too too out there on social media. I mean, I, obviously for Cane Brewing Company, I, yeah. I post all this stuff, but you know, um, I answer all the emails. So if you do send an email into us, we'll get back to you. And that's sort of where we're at. If you want to find us, send us an email through the website. Come to the tasting room, have a beer. But uh, yeah, otherwise, check check Instagram and Facebook. And it's Kane with a K, by the way. Uh, if you have questions uh, for me, guests you'd like to hear, um, topics you'd like here uh, to. 
be discussed on an upcoming episode, you can reach me at John Hall, it's J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at beerandbrewing.com, or you can join the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall or Instagram at Mr. John Hall, because I'm fancy like that. Uh, also, head over to beerandbrewing.com, the magazine's website, where you can read all about homebrewing, what's happening in the beer world today, and get insight from professional brewers. While there, you can also subscribe to the magazine. Please subscribe to the magazine. Support quality independent journalism. Uh, we need you guys now more than ever. Mike, thanks again. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.